Hello, everybody. Welcome again to OCN. We're glad to have you. And uh, we've got an exciting thing today. We want to talk about taking the offensive against Satan, against the enemy. Now, our enemies are not flesh and blood, but they're principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places, according to Ephesians 6, verse 12. And so we want to equip you so that you can do this. You can take the offensive against the enemy. So first of all, let me ask you this question. Can you name one war that was won by defensive measures only? No, I can't. There was none. Can you name one sport that was won by playing defense only? No, once again, you can't do it because it, defense doesn't win. And so what about one debate maybe is won by defensive means only? No, once again, you have to take the offensive. That's right. And, you know, it makes me kind of angry that God's people are continually on the defensive. They're defending against attacks of sickness and attacks of allergies and uh, false accusations against them and uh, demonic oppression and sinful habits. Those things bother the body of Christ terribly. And so they're all defensive things. And so Ephesians chapter 6, let's turn over there and let's look at both the armor of defense and let's look at the offensive weapons we have. So Ephesians 6, and talking about defense, just for a moment, let's look at verses 13 through 16. Ephesians 6, 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Now that's the armor supposed, supposedly on your body. All right? 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. What is truth? That's what Pilate said. The truth is the word of God. God, Jesus said in John 17, 17, Father, your word is truth. So it's the word. Verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In order to prepare to give out the gospel of peace, you have to look at the word and get your, in both the inspiration and the material to share from the word. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Okay, now that shield of faith is necessary, there's no, no question about it, but usually a shield isn't used as an offensive weapon, but a defensive. And so you can, yes, you can quench the fiery darts of Satan, but isn't it better to put him on the defensive instead of you always on the defense? So, it's time to take the offensive, which is the title of this talk, taking the offensive against the devil. It's time to do that. And if we go a little bit further, Ephesians 6, verse 17 and 18, talks about how to do this. Verse 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Okay, so we have three things, offensive weapons. Now you might argue with me a little bit because I'm going to say one of the offensive weapons is the helmet of salvation. How is that offensive? Because it tells you who you are in Jesus Christ. And once you know who you are, 
you are emboldened to press on to deal with the enemy and to put him under your feet. So it's an offensive weapon to know who you are in Jesus Christ. It's very important. If you don't know who you are, you're going to lose the, lose the battle. There's no question about it. So let's talk about those three things. Let's talk about first the new creation man, which is exemplified by the helmet of salvation. Then we'll be talking about the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. And then we'll be talking about prayer, the third objective here. So let's start with a new creation man. Who is this person? <clears throat> the Bible says, those who are in Christ Jesus. Look over in 1 Corinthians 5.17. The 2 Corinthians, pardon me. 2 Corinthians 5.17. That's right. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That is a tremendous promise. Well, how do you know that you are in Christ? If you are in Christ, you're a new man, a new woman, a new creature in Jesus. But how do you know you're new? Let's look over at 1 John chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. 1 John chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. All right, verse 23 says, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So that's two things. Believe on the name of Jesus and love one another like Jesus loved us, loves us. And so, verse 24, and he that keeps his commandments dwells in him. There, we're in him. Right there. We keep those two commandments. I'm not talking the Ten Commandments. I'm talking the two commandments in the New Testament. Believe on the name of Jesus, who he is, what he did. Commit to him. It's not just belief. It's a commitment to him. And keep the love commandment, to love one another like Jesus loves us. Those two things. If you do those two things, you are definitely a new creature in Christ. Brand new. Never has been one like you before. So, he is the new creation inside. Now, this is a spiritual creation, folks. This is not a physical creation. This is a spiritual creation. And so, we are body, soul, and spirit. We were created by God in the first creation, which was a physical creation, created us body, soul, and spirit. The spirit is the thing that communicates with God. Your soul is your intellect, your emotions, and your will. And your body, of course, you deal with that every day. It's the physical thing that, that you live inside. Because you are not your body. You are a spirit inside your body. And so, <clears throat> we were created that way, body, soul, and spirit. But the new creation, which comes to those who commit to Jesus and love one another, that new creation is a spiritual creation. It's like we have a new, brand new spirit, and it's like God's, just like his. We can contaminate our spirit man through sin, but repentance restores it totally. And so, we are like 
God. A little lower, a little lower than God. We are not Jesus. We are not God. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God with a very high standing in creation. Above the angels, that's right. Because over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, don't you know we're going to judge angels? God never has a lesser creature judge a greater creature. Pardon me, that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And so we judge angels, if we do that, we're higher than they. There's no question about it. Psalm 8 says that God has put man above all the works of his hands. Well, the works of his hands include the angels. So we are a little lower, created a little lower than Elohim, which is God himself. Because God wanted a race, a family, in which he could live, he could inhabit, and he could commune with them constantly, not just once a day like he did with Adam in the evening. No. This time, we, the new creation man, can communicate with God all day, anytime, or night, anytime. Constant communion, because the greater one lives in us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit live inside us. It's amazing. So, <clears throat> now, if this man believes, he can do the works of Jesus and the greater works. Over in John 14, verse 12, it talks about that. Now, that is tremendous. Did you ever think you could do the works of Jesus? Oh, well, Jesus told you you could. John 14, verse 12 through 14 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And whatever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And folks, I want you to notice that verb ask is a, has a special meaning here. It means require, require. So we don't command, but we require because we're children of God. We're his family members. And you know, doesn't a good father, when his son or daughter asks for something, hurry to give them what they desire? That's right. Just like an earthly father, but our heavenly father is better by far. And he will give whatever we desire when we ask him in faith. So we can do the works of Jesus and the greater works. That's right. Look at whatever Jesus did in the Gospels, the four Gospels. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out the demons. He walked on the water. He stilled the storm. He has absolute authority over nature. Now, how many of those things have you done already? It might be interesting to find out. Ask yourself. Look at your past life. Have you done these things? Have you healed the sick? Have you raised the dead? That's right. It's not impossible because Jesus says you can do it right here. Yeah, we've done a lot of these things. I haven't walked on water yet, but there's been no need. Okay, let's go on. Now, another thing about this new creation man is sin has no dominion over him, no domination of him. If you look over in Romans chapter 6, uh, look at verse 14. Romans 6, verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Wow. You, you have power over sin. 
You do not need to bow the knee to sin. You do not need to say, I'm helpless. I can't do anything. I'm under the bondage of sin because that's what you were before Jesus Christ came into your life. You were helpless. The product of your life was sin continually, but no longer. The product of your life now is righteousness. That's right. And holiness. That's the product of the new creation man's life. Let's go on. But new creation man, a spiritual man, has a soul, which is the old soul that he had before Jesus came into his life. That old soul is his mind, his emotions, and his will. And that has to be trained to conform to the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, that's why God placed us here, is to be trained to train our soul after we are made a new creation man, we have to train our soul so that we look like Jesus on the inside. That's right. We act like him, we talk like him, we have faith like him, we do everything just like him. That's God's objective for keeping us here till we are reach the maturity of Christ, the standard of the maturity of Christ. Now, some have done it because the Bible says the fivefold ministry exists until all come into that fullness of the maturity of Christ. So, evidently, some have already done it at the time of the writing of the New Testament. So, it's not impossible. You can do it, God expects you to do it. He expects you to be mature. He doesn't say sinless. He says mature. So if you do sin, you repent immediately. Repentance cleanses you and brings you back to fellowship with God. That's right. Now, repentance means going the opposite direction. You don't go the direction that you have just gone, but you turn around. And you say, never again. I'm not going to do that again. That's repentance. And the Lord will cleanse you from all unrighteousness, as he says in 1 John 1, 9. Now, what about the soul? Let's have a look at this. <clears throat> the person must put on the new man over, over in Ephesians 4, verse 23 and 24. It's quite clear. Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3.10. Ephesians 4, verse 23 and 4 says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You've got to put that new man on. It means you have to train your soul. That's right. And look at Colossians 3.10 couple pages away, Colossians 3.10. And have put on the new man that is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Folks, this isn't knowledge of the world. This is knowledge of God. Knowledge of how he acts, what he is, how he hates sin, what he likes. Knowledge of God, intimate knowledge. That's what we're after. And that is the new man. The new man seeks to please God in all things. <clears throat> Over in Romans 13, 14, it says, Don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. There you go. That is the personality that we must put on, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can. We can. Absolutely. Now, how do we renew our mind? There's a way to do it. Let's look at Romans 12, verse 2. Romans 12, verse 2. Okay. 
The Bible talks about, says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We use the word of God to transform us. And the power of the Holy Spirit within us. That's why he lives in us. Is a sanctifying power, meaning a transforming power, inside us, using the means of the word of God to change the way we act, the way we behave, the way we talk, everything about our personality, the way we respond. Now, some people say, <coughs> excuse me, some people say, I gave my will to God. That is not correct. That's a passive statement. That means that God is responsible for everything. No, no, no. No. You don't want to do that. What you want to do is, Actively, with your will, choose God's will. You are active. And you say, Lord, I know what you have said and what you have asked, and I will do it. I choose to do it. That way you retain your will. You don't give it up to anybody. But you choose God's will. That is the new creation man. Praise the Lord. A new creation man must have a mindset to overcoming. Yes, overcoming. That's his mindset. So whenever he goes into a battle, he must have the mindset of winning, not losing. In fact, losing is far from him. Hallelujah. Now, let's look at the Word of God. You have to find offensive warfare verses in the Word of God and be ready to quote them to the enemy. I'm going to give you some offensive warfare verses, just uh, four of them here. Just as an example, look over at Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 11. Jeremiah 10, verse 11. It says, Thus shall you say to them, that's the evil spirits, your enemy. Thus shall you say to them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. That's right, you can tell them you're going to perish from under these heavens. Amen. Look over at Jeremiah 20, 11. Jeremiah 20, verse 11. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble, and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. And you can command them to be confused in the name of Jesus. Let's look at Jeremiah 30, verse 23 and 24. Jeremiah 30. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goes forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked, and you can threaten them with that. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he has done it, until he has performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days you shall consider it. Wow, that's a powerful scripture. You can bring pain upon the heads of the wicked spirits. That's right. You can do it. In Jesus' name. Let's take one more. Isaiah 41, 11 and 12. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 11 and 12. These are such powerful scriptures. I want to tell you that if you go through the Psalms, there are... 50 verses in the Psalms, which are offensive warfare verses. In Isaiah, there are 25 warfare verses. And in Jeremiah, there are 18 warfare verses. Let's look over at Isaiah 41, 11 and 12. 
Behold, all they that were incensed against you shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and shall not find them. Even them that contended with you, they that war against you shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. That's so powerful. Now, let's go to the third thing, prayer. Prayer, very important. Now, the prayer may be in the spirit, in tongues. You use the offensive verses also, which I just gave you, and you can find your own. The prayers, various kinds of prayer. Prayer of intercession, as it says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 1, you first pray for your leadership in your country and in your state and in your, your city. That's first. Then there's a prayer of faith in Mark eleven twenty four, that whatever things you desire, believe that you received them and you shall have them. That's powerful. So you believe you received before you see the manifestation of it. The third type of prayer is a prayer of agreement. Over in Matthew 18, verse 19, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them, Jesus said, by my Father who is in heaven. So you have to be in agreement as to what you're going to pray and how you're going to do it. Then it'll be done for you. Hallelujah. Then there's a prayer of consecration where you can consecrate everything to God. You don't know exactly what his will is at this point. And that's the only prayer where you can say, Lord, if it be your will. You can't pray if it be your will with the prayer of faith or with the prayer of intercession. No. You, we know God's will. How do we know it? From the word of God. Very clear. But in cases like, Lord, who do I marry? Or this new job is being offered, should I take this job? That is the kind of thing that I'm talking about for the prayer of consecration. Then the third one is the prayer, or the fourth one, fifth one, pardon, <laughs> united prayer or corporate prayer, where you get together and you pray the same thing. Over in Acts chapter 4, the disciples practice that. Very important. Chapter 4 of Acts, and look at uh, verse 24. And they, when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who has made heaven and earth and sea. And they made an agreement that if God would heal, they would be bold. And so they all prayed that. Binding and loosing. You bind the enemy and you loose the angels to go after him. That's in Matthew 18, 18. Then you listen also, as David did, for God's plan and strategy to attack the enemy. And finally, you declare and decree a thing. And Job says, when you do that, it'll be established unto you. Hallelujah. That's the way we triumph. Right. By knowing who we are in Christ, right? By the word of God, which is so powerful, and by prayer, all kinds of prayer. Prayer in the spirit as well. So I trust you've learned something valuable today. Practice it. Go out and do it. And defeat the enemy every time. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.